Hello and welcome to Bondcast, a podcast series where we discuss the latest themes and events shaping rates markets. I'm Imogen Bakra, European rate strategist, and I'm joined today by our global market specialists, John Briggs and Theo Chapsalis. Before getting into the discussion, I just wanted to quickly remind you to hit the subscribe button so you can listen to our latest episodes as soon as they're available. And if any of our listeners did have any questions for our Bondcasters, please email us at bondcast at natwest.com. So um, we've had some quite big market moves this week. I think um, Delta variant concerns were kind of weighing on markets quite significantly at the beginning of the week. So um, what we might have hoped for as a quiet July week hasn't been <laughs> as much. And then, of course, we finished the week off today on Thursday when we're recording it with um, the ECB, which for us in Europe has been quite a key event. Um, it was a fairly dovish ECB meeting to the extent that they, you know, obviously had already set this slightly higher inflation target at the strategic review last week. um, And they'd uh, reiterated or re-emphasized the symmetry around that target. So we knew that they had to be dovish and imply a kind of lower for longer policy, Um, but they actually weren't as dovish as they could have been in that they reframed the forward guidance um, to reflect this new uh, inflation target and reflect the symmetry around that target. Um, but it doesn't go as far as suggesting, or this forward guidance doesn't go as far as suggesting they need to see actual inflation at 2%. They just need to see inflation evidence that inflation is getting to 2% by the midpoint of their forecast um, and then durably staying there um, over their forecast horizon. So um, for those that aren't kind of as keen ECB watchers, their forecast horizon is is usually three years or or four years if they're getting towards the end of the year. So um, it implies inflation getting to 2% um, about one and a half years away and and then staying there for the next one and a half years. Um, So it was dovish, um, but yeah, like I say, not as dovish as they could have been because um, they could have said that they will wait for inflation to get to 2% before they start tightening policy. I think that that's probably the result of some uh, compromise between the doves and the hawks on the council. Um, And they also didn't go as far as to kind of pre-commit around the persistence of any policy. You know, the key message from the strategic review is that monetary policy will need to be more persistent in order to reach the inflation aim. Uh, We interpret that as needing kind of the same level of easiness but for longer than we'd previously um, kind of imagined so more QE beyond March 2022 which is the planned end date of PEP Um, all of those kind of extensions Lagarde told us were not discussed so um, anything to do with it PEP extension wasn't discussed and TLTROs wasn't discussed so they kind of fell short there of, of telling us how they might recreate this or create this lower for longer policy, but it, it still was a, a dovish meeting. Thank you, Imogen. This is this is quite comprehensive. And given the interlinkage between the UK and the Euro area, well, I've got a genuine interest and uh, I'm curious to find out more about what it means for, you know, for the market in general. So let me stay with the, with the Eurozone. What does it mean for the curve in terms of shape? And also what does it mean for credit spreads like uh, Italy versus Germany, for example. Yeah, so to be honest, I don't think this really changes our outlook either for spreads or for the shape of the curve or our kind of directional view. It's, you know, the meeting was pretty much as expected. Um, I think that it implies for the very front end, so kind of twos, fives will remain pretty well pinned. Um, We've spoken on this podcast previously about how the market was expecting a too aggressive hiking profile in our view for the ECB. Um, A dovish ECB, not just today, but over the last few weeks has pushed back those expectations of a hike. So the market's now expecting the first full hike by uh, mid 2024, which seems more reasonable, but still seems the kind of earliest possible date in our view you know we think this ECB will err on the side of caution and not want to tighten prematurely so 2025 is probably more likely um so this kind of lower for longer strategy I think just keeps that front end very well pinned for the longer end of the curve it's a bit more ambiguous you know uh, a dovish ECB that's doing QE for longer initially markets will interpret as a, a kind of bullish uh outcome for for longer end rates but I think actually 
beyond that initial reaction um, over the kind of longer term, fundamentals can matter more. You know, we're very optimistic still on the growth outcome. Um, we still have this view that actually if inflation is becoming more less transitory and perhaps more permanent in the UK and the US, then um, that will have some read across for Europe too. And also if the ECB is kind of doubling down on its commitment to reach this inflation target, then belief in that can bring about higher growth and, and higher inflation expectations too. So it's a flows versus fundamentals argument for the longer end. And ultimately we think fundamentals can, um, can win. Um, and for spreads, it's really just the same old story. You know, a supportive ECB in vol control mode adds to what we think is a, an already long list to, to kind of like spreads through the summer and, and into year end as well. So I guess that's probably enough on the ECB today since it wasn't the most exciting meeting and, and we also discussed in depth the strategic review last week. So let's look ahead to the next important central bank meeting, which will be the Fed next week. So the last meeting was the meeting, John, where they said, you know, this was the one where they're talking about talking about tapering. Um, do we think that changes next week? Is next week's meeting the meeting where they're talking about tapering or are they still just talking about talking about yeah, I think that's right. I think they're going to be talking about tapering. I expect staff to present various options for future tapering. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily we're going to learn a lot about it. You know, whether Powell discusses any of those options in press conference, I doubt. Um, I think that, you know, as far as things that we're looking for is, has there been substantial progress towards economic recovery by their metrics in order to move it forward? They talked about having an ample lead time in communication. You know, so what is what does that mean if they're if they're we're thinking about the sequencing of of tapering? Is it you know start talking about it you know more formally in September? Or you announce in September that it's comes going to start tapering in December or year end? You know, so some some guidance around any of that would be helpful. Although I think it's going to be relatively limited because I think they're going to say we haven't met the threshold of substantial progress yet, and we continue to discuss tapering. The minutes of this meeting on, on when it comes to tapering might be more interesting than actually what we get out of um, Powell and the press conference. Um, just while we're on the subject, though, a couple other things we are looking for is if you've been paying attention, and as you know, listeners know, the Fed has been kind of moving away from this idea that the uptick inflation is transitory. Powell actually dropped that word from his opening remarks at the semi-annual monetary policy testimony. And instead, they're talking about how we expect it to remain high for the coming months. So there could be some changes in the statement regarding, you know, the language around the inflation side. And again, I think that you've also noticed that this is just part of, oh, well, it's base effects, then it's reopening, now it's supply chain. So they're trying to set the market up for the fact that we, you know, that this inflation overshoot, or I shouldn't say overshoot, perhaps this inflation, these higher than expected inflation prints, um, could be with us for a lot longer, but you know, don't worry about it. We're still on the ball. We're still watching things. So I think some change in the inflation language. Another question that we've been getting a lot, and you know, this can be, uh, I'll call this one of the Boncast questions, um, even though I guess formally it wasn't, but we, we get a lot from clients and internally is that, it, are they going to mention Delta variant? Are they going to mention downside risk to the economy? Um, I think it's too soon to tell. I think that clearly he'll probably mention that in the press conference. I'm not sure that that we've had enough data, enough um, conclusions on the hospitalization and you know fatality linkage between the new Delta variant in the U.S., which is still relatively highly vaccinated, to to have a conclusion to have enough of a conclusion for the Fed to put it in the formal statement, which is a little bit higher bar than him discussing it as an obvious risk in the press conference. Yeah, that was actually going to be my follow on question as well as how they that. I think that makes sense. And, you know, it's something that we saw uh, from the ECB as well. They kind of recognize the fact that it does create downside risk, but offset by the fact that there's still high vaccinations and, and rates that are still increasing in, in Europe. So I guess my only follow up question then for the Fed will be that we have had these really quite large market moves this week. Um, I was actually out on Monday and Tuesday and I was very surprised, not checking my phone at all. I was very surprised to come in on Wednesday morning to see where markets are at having left at the end of last week. So do you think that the market has kind of taken too much fed out of in this rally? Like has it gone too far in, in its repricing? 
I, I do. Um, you know, we've taken out a lot of future Fed down the road. And, you know, given our growth inflation forecast, which still remain optimistic, I think the market is going to start pricing that back in. I mean, we're still in a lot of those, you know, um, weaker belly curve flattening five cents, five thirty types views, just because you're in that part of the normal part of the cycle. And as we continue to see persistent inflation, and as long as the growth outlook holds up, the market should price that back in. Now, that said, I think it's going to be several weeks, and this is just more of a broad view, uh, even outside the U.S. I think it's going to take a few weeks here for us to make the conclusion that we can be still confident on the growth outside growth outlook, outlook because um, of the delta, like I said before, the transmission between cases and hospitalizations. So it's too early to tell because of the lags between, you know, obviously case counts and, and hospitalizations, 10 to 14 days, you know, the incubation times, all the stuff that we know from the last year and a half. Um, but we're watching all that very closely in actually 17 different nations that we have hospitalization data for. So if you get highly vaccinated countries like the US and UK and, and now Europe, and you have been able to break that linkage, then we can be, be still optimistic on the growth outlook, at least in those economies. So this era or this new theme of growth concern, of Delta worries, of market volatility, I think is going to remain with us for the next several weeks until, you know, everybody on this call can conclude that, yeah, we're actually okay. This is just going to be the new normal. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have, you know, 10-year yields in the U.S., you know, gapping 10 basis points a day or equities selling off and then rallying back by percentage to one to two percentage points. You know, we might just be setting into a new volatile range in some of these assets. Um, so we don't have to have, you know, risk off every day for the next few weeks, but it might just take a few weeks for us to have more confidence. We, not just us, you know, as strategists, but the world to have confidence that these growth outlooks are, are going to stay resilient if we can um, break that linkage. That makes sense. Thanks, John. So switching over to the UK then, because um, central banking and inflation and variants are there. So we have one big, very joined up theme this week. Now, we've obviously got CB, CEO, who's at kind of one end of the uh, spectrum in terms of much lower for longer. Then we've got the Fed, who we now think are going to start talking about tapering. Uh, and Within the Bank of England, we seem to have this kind of dichotomy of, uh, I would say, much more outspoken hawkish and much more outspoken dovish members um, who seem to have kind of opposing views at the moment. And we've had heard a lot from both sides over the past couple of weeks. So where do you think the Bank of England kind of settles on, on that debate then? Yeah, I think it has been definitely a very exciting uh, period of the last two weeks. So last week we had the Hawks, we had uh, BOE member Saunders coming out with very strong arguments in favor of, of tightening. Uh, he has spoken about inflation, that inflation is not transitory, and that was um, clearly stated in his piece. So basically says that, yes, there are some transitory elements, but we cannot assume that the entire upside surprise is because of transitory elements. The day before, we had also Ramstein, who was also supportive of some form of tightening. But this week, it, it, it was different. This week, we had Haskell, obviously a dove, uh, and he he actually delivered a summary of his of his speech, and he explicitly says that a tighter po policy tightening is not the right policy right now. We had also the newest member of the BOA, Catherine Mann, providing some arguments that are on the on the on the dovish side. And today, uh, Rams, uh, sorry, not Ramson, Broadbent, actually, um, he delivered some very dovish remarks. Basically, he said that you can look at lumber prices, for example, and yes, some commodity prices and, and, and you know, all that goods inflation that has supported higher inflation, but that is something transitory. The best action is to deliver nothing. And the word nothing explicitly has been written in his speech. So to me, where does it leave us? We have, a, we have a divide. We have a central bank that is definitely moving to the hawkish direction. It is definitely the most hawkish, or I would say the least dovish of the three major central banks. So we are not talking about more QE or at significant departure pace. And we definitely do talk about reducing accommodation. And in fact, we will get probably votes in favor of reducing QE at the August meeting. 
Saunders is is a very likely candidate to vote for it. But still, it seems that as things stand, the BOE will pretty much not change anything in terms of policy. Now, the question is, does the hike get delivered at some point, you know, in November or in August or, you know, Feb 2023. So it will be delivered either late 2022 or early 2023. But we're definitely moving towards a more hawkish PoE, and we definitely do expect to see some, um, you know, more hawkish headlines as the balance shift from being unambiguously dovish to doves and hawks living together. What does that mean for markets then? Um, you know, you said. Um, we are expecting the first hike maybe end 2022 or 2023. Is that more dovish versus market expectations? And how are you thinking the Bank of England kind of plays into your, uh, I guess, core uh, guilt's views and, and also on the inflation side as well? Yeah, I think the, the way that the market interprets that is that the BOE will actually have to tighten fairly soon. So we have uh, the hike being priced uh, around May, uh, the first 15 base point hike. So we have, you know, a central bank that you will have expectations of a central bank that will have to deliver a hike fairly soon. And with that in mind, the market actually prices in a fairly low terminal rate. So the market prices in a very short tightening cycle. Now, our view is that the BOE will be slightly more patient that the BOE will not be unsettled by temporarily higher inflation. Um, there are good reasons for inflation to be higher, right? But the BOE will have to look at the bigger picture and that the BOE will avoid uh, over tightening, especially given that other central banks are in no hurry to tighten. If that happens, then we talk about still a steeper curve where you know the front end is supported lower, but then you allow that higher inflation to price in more of an inflation risk premium at the longer end. Where does it leave us? Uh, we've got a short position at the 10 year part. Uh, we maintain that position. Uh, and we think that this is the part of the curve where investors should be short. Do you have a target for um, yields in 10 year? Has it, has it been updated recently or is it still um, the 1% target from before? Well, I guess there is a bigger question to what extent, you know, there is, um, you know, there is a general need to update targets given what has happened in overall fixed income, right? There's been a move, which is undeniable. We talk about, is it 50 basis points or 40 basis points, uh, depending on how high beta the market is in the US. Obviously you've got the highest beta and once you've got the lowest beta in the UK is somewhere in between. So right now the target is still 1% and it is something that we've left, but it comes, it, 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 it comes as, a, as, as quite a big question, which is given that we did have some technical buying that has moved and has repriced over a fixed income richer, maybe we need to get used to, or we need to assume that the target and that the bearish move will be a little bit lower to the extent that at least in the UK, um, as you know, there are still guys, there are still investors who want to buy their dip. So we think that in the sell-off, there will be some buyers, in which case maybe the peak that we reach is a little bit less than 1%. But as things stand, we do we do have 1% as still our target for 10-year rates. All right, thank you, Theo. All right, let's 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 wrap it up there then this week because um, I think the Bank of England and the Fed and probably the ECB tier is, is something that we'll be coming back to um, quite frequently over the next couple of weeks. So we'll catch up again next Thursday. Yeah, next Thursday uh, after the Fed meeting. Thanks everyone for joining me again this week. And just a reminder to our listeners that if you liked today's episode, please hit the like button to show your appreciation and click subscribe so you can listen to our latest episodes as soon as they're available. And again, if you'd like to ask our Bondcasters any questions, please send them in to bondcast at natwest.com. Thanks. See you next week.